Hello, I'm Dan Sullivan, and this is an overview of the first course in the XML series, the XML Fundamentals course. Now, when you write a program to process XML, you've got quite a few APIs to choose from. In .NET, you've got things like XDocument and XML document, XML Reader. In Windows, there are things like PowerShell, and then there's the COM component, MSXML. In Java, there's JAXP, and then there are things like Saxon and Zalen, and the list goes on and on. This course isn't about any of those APIs. It's about the extensible markup language and namespaces in XML recommendations published by the World Wide Web Consortium, the W3C. Oh, and, and that's my teaching partner. He never really says anything, but every now and then in the course, he pops up with his whiteboard with some reference material, like the URLs for the XML and the namespaces in XML recommendations I just mentioned. Now, this course doesn't pour through the XML recommendations word by word and dissect them. It covers concepts and details and backs them up with examples and the recommendations themselves. When you're done with this course, you'll be able to leverage the various features of XML to represent the kinds of data that programs typically go in process. And you'll understand the basis for all those APIs. And you'll also feel comfortable going back to the XML recommendations if you want to drill a bit deeper or just refresh yourself in the future. So the XML and the namespaces in XML recommendations define what XML is. So what do they say about it? Well, first of all, they go through the syntax. And the syntax is really important, and we cover that in the course. But typically in a program, you don't work directly with the syntax. You don't want to be doing things like there's a left angle bracket followed by a P, followed by an O, on and on, and then say, oh yeah, that must be a, a point element I've just found. You really want to work with some kind of abstraction of XML. For example, there's the information set recommendation published by the W3C. There's a data model in the XPath recommendation. And if you've worked with HTML, you've probably worked with the DOM core, but that applies to XML too. And for all practical purposes, every API you work with has its own abstraction of XML. Well, we're not going to work with any of those abstractions either. We're going to work with the one that's defined in the XML recommendation. That's the XML document. Now, I, I know what you're saying. I know what an XML document is. It's, it's one of those files full of pointy brackets. And, and you'd be right, that is an XML document. But the W3 is a bit more particular in how they go about defining what an XML document is. The XML recommendation says an XML document has a physical structure and a logical structure. Now, XML was originally developed to create printed documents, and printed documents often have images in them, and those images are typically binary files, not XML files. And it's also pretty common to take a document and factor it up into multiple files. For example, for books, it's pretty typical to have each chapter be a separate file. Well, it's the physical structure of the XML document that ties all those pieces together. The DTD, or document type definition, is part of the physical structure of the XML document. And you can use the DTD to define the physical structure of the XML document. You do this with entity declarations. An entity declaration associates a symbol with an identifier for some resource. And that resource might just be some simple replacement text. It might be some XML. It might even be an image that's going to be used in that document. So the physical structure uses the entity declarations to tie together all the pieces of the XML document. You can use the DTD to define the logical structure of an XML document. The logical structure of an XML document is all of the elements and attributes that it contains. So it can say things like a book element must have a publisher attribute and contain chapter attributes. It's really the type part of document type definition because it defines the type of the XML document you're working with. However, an XML document can be freeform. It doesn't have to have its logical structure defined within a DTD. One of the big concepts in XML is content and markup. Content is something an author writes, and an editor marks up that content to classify what the pieces of text in it are. For example, this is a title, this is a quote, this is a chapter. 
Then the marked up content is processed to produce a printed document. Maybe it goes and drives a typesetter that sets up printing presses. This fits nicely into the way that programs typically work with data because it corresponds to data and metadata. And it's one of the reasons why XML is so useful for representing data. Another issue XML has to deal with, not all the time, but sometimes, is namespaces. Namespaces are used to prevent collisions between names. I might define an invoice element, and you might define one too. How are we supposed to tell the difference between them? Well, many programming languages use namespaces to do this sort of thing, and so does XML. Another issue XML has to deal with is language, and that breaks down into two things, encoding and locale. XML uses Unicode, so it can represent just about any printed language in use today. However, Unicode characters have to be encoded to be put into a computer file. Now, XML can use any encoding you want, but it usually works best with UTF-8 or UTF-16 encoding. But one of the key features of XML is it can automatically detect the encoding of a file without any out-of-band information. Sometimes some of the text in an XML document is specific to a particular locale. XML includes the XML lang attribute that can be used to classify text as coming from a particular locale, like a price maybe from the US versus a price from Great Britain. And there are a number of miscellaneous features in XML too. For example, XML supports comments, of course, and it also has something called processing instructions, which you can sort of think of as being specialized comments. In some cases, it'll normalize and trim white space for you too. Well, that gives you a good idea of the kind of topics that'll be covered in this course. As for me, I've got to get going and start working on my next course. So I hope you enjoy the XML Fundamentals course and learn a lot from it.